Good evening and welcome to For the Record. We're joined tonight by the newly appointed Minister for Health and Medical Services, Dr. Ifiremi Wangai Nambete. Good evening, sir. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, Thank you for joining thanks. us. Thank you for having me. So let's start off with uh, some of the things that you've implemented, some of the things that you've done um, within the first month uh, of your appointment. Tell us how it's been so far. It's been uh, quite enjoyable. Um, uh, serving the public of Fiji is uh, obviously enjoyable. I did that on a you know different aspect in health for 20 years, and you know I'm going again doing it in a, you know in a governance role and. Uh, Really, uh, medicine and health is, uh, we keep on talking about it's a vocation rather than a job. And so, you know, there's, uh, I take my head off, there's a lot of uh, really professional and very hardworking uh, health professionals out there um, who have been my colleagues all this time and continue to do the work on the ground. And uh, it's been nice being able to, um, uh, you know, support them. Uh, in the new role, so really, that's you know, that's how I see myself as supporting my, you know, my colleagues uh, in, in this role in governance. Stepping up to a role like this, you really have your work cut out for you, and it must have been quite an enjoyable experience to have the public support. Because given uh, previous uh, instances where people would be appointed to this position, the public would not necessarily have as much faith in whoever it was that was stepping up and you know the surgeons of uh, people just saying he's the right guy for the job he knows what he's doing and he's definitely going to be taking us forward must have been quite an a memorable experience when you first got into the job um, yes um, <coughs> obviously I'm, I'm not big on social media and, and, and uh, even mainstream media you know I have to remind myself to read it it's been like that ever since I've been working as a surgeon so, you know, get up early in the morning, go to work sort of thing and get on with the job. Uh, people have uh, been telling me what has been happening within those circles. Um, but um, one of the things that uh, I realize is that uh, there's been a lot of good work done so far. Uh, and the Honorable Prime Minister and uh, his government over the years, you know, have very pure and sincere thoughts of moving our nation forward to be a modern nation state in a healthy nation state. And I could realize that as a surgeon, that uh, that's what they intend to do. So really that's why I put my hand up to be part of the group. And being given the portfolio was an added bonus. Uh, you know, is, and, uh, and I know what the vision is. I can see his vision. Uh, I was a medical superintendent for a few years. Um, I worked as a surgeon for quite a while. So I realized, you know, th this is an awesome vision. And uh, that's why I put my hand up meant to be part in, you know, of that process. And you know, really it's enhancing the good work that's already been done. Um, as you rightfully said, health, health is challenging. Uh, and, and around the world, health, uh, ministries of health, you know, uh, they are challenging. It's not limited to Fiji. Uh, and really, you know, if you think about it, it's because there's a few things. Number one is with health. You know, we're not a revenue-creating uh, ministry. Uh, that's that's one for sure. And number two is, um, you know, it uh, health is very emotive uh, to everyone, even around the world. And so, you know, those are the challenges that we have. But uh, you know, as I said, you know, it's I can see the vision, and and I want to be part of that process and enhancing also the good work that's been done already. Well, before we look into what 2019 holds in store for the general public, let's just do a quick review of 2018. Uh, there have been so many uh, different programs that were implemented. Many of them were successful. One of them notably was the uh, MENC vaccination program that was uh, successful. The number of Zika and uh, dengue cases also dropped in the last year. That was, of course, uh, due to the fact that of uh, a lot and a lot of uh, public education on that and also with the Wolbachia program that had gone on. There may have been a few other things that may have happened that the public may not be aware of. Would you like to highlight that? Yeah, the, um, I, I note just recently that even the suicide rate has dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a testament to, you know, a lot of the advocacy that's, that's out there around mental health. Uh, you know, I, um, I salute our mental health uh, professionals. There are not many of them, uh, but they work very, very hard. Um, and, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a space that's continued to grow. Um, also within our hospitals, we're, we're having a growing cohort 
of our local specialists. And these are trained locally, go across to overseas, mm -hmm. just like I did. <coughs> Spent some time, worked as uh, for two, three, four, five, even some five years uh, in uh, very senior positions, and they, they've come back. And the reason why they've come back is, uh, one of the reasons is because our salaries have gone up mm -hmm. for doctors, you know, and our salaries have become very competitive now. And so they can be able to come back and uh, you'll be able to work and they're beginning to lift the game in, in that area. Also our nurses, uh, you know, the government has invested a lot in our nurses. We have not only a lot of nurses from the, uh, from the undergraduate institutions, but we also having professional, you know, a postgraduate study for nurses. Uh, and we are beginning also to grow, you know, nurse specialists. Uh, that's something that uh, we didn't have before and also with our allied health uh, personnel. So with health, our, our biggest resource is uh, our human resource. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something that uh, we now have <coughs> a growing uh, human resource capacity that we didn't have before, beginning with the doctors, mm -hmm. you know. And when I was a young doctor, there was only about 200 of us. Now, I may be wrong, but nearly 800 doctors in the country now, nearly 800, and still growing. Yeah. And I guess that's the culmination of um the government's work to sort of grow local uh, local specialists by you know uh, all of these changes have been happening um, I guess over the last four or five years just to help uh, local talent grow so um, you've been busy in the recent weeks uh, after uh, cyclone to cyclone Mona uh, carrying out inspections at evacuation centers and, and communicating with hospitals and other medical services tell us about that it's um with, with any natural disasters, with health, there's uh, two responses. Number one is what we call the clinical response. And this is really because of, um, you know, the, the, the acute hit, so, you know, the trauma. For example, it's a cyclone, people break their legs, break their hands, people die, uh, uh, some drown, <coughs> uh, some people get cut, lacerated. So, you know, the specialists, the surgeons, the anesthetists, the specialists in this area, they provide the acute support in that area. But uh, more importantly, when that's done, then the one that's ongoing and, and which can be a problem is the public health uh, aspect, which is infectious diseases. Um, and that's where we've, you know, we've really targeted. We've targeted both. So we had a specialist on standby. And as I said, when I was a surgeon, I was part of a group that was on standby for acute trauma. Uh, and then we have also have a public health group. So. When we had the evacuation centers, they were they, they rose away and they were there in the evacuation centers. They went, saw them, um, they uh, spoke to them about good hygiene practices. They gave what we call wash kits, which is, uh, you know, uh, kits which had buckets, um, collapsible containers, uh, um, water purifying tablets, uh, sanitary pads, and so on. And, um, you know, they also visited the toilets and bathrooms and and also, you know, um, supported them in terms of how they, you know, um, look after rubbish. So you really need mm -hmm. to, you know, consider every aspect of public health when it comes to post-cyclone inspections. Both are important, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, we have a lot to discuss with the minister, but we'll be back right after the break. Welcome back to For the Record. Now, before the break, we were discussing um, post-cyclone Mona work that the ministry has been doing, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, but let's look at something that's always on the spotlight, something that's on everyone's tongue all the time, NCDs in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the ministry has been very proactive in trying to get people educated about the dangers of diabetes and the uh, complications of that, and of course, cardiovascular diseases, which was, of course, one of the uh, major causes of death uh, mortality rates in the past year. Uh, what do you see the ministry doing in 2019 to sort of curb that even more? <coughs> With uh, NCDs, um, the data shows that back in uh, 1970, our prevalence of diabetes, which is uh, how many people in the population had diabetes, was about 2%. And after that, it just kept on rising, 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 rising. And I want to set the record straight, because it's for the record, that this did not happen in the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. This has been steadily climbing and climbing. The most climb happened in the late 1980s, beginning of 1990s and so forth. That's when this became like this. So really we are on the back end uh, <coughs> of a process that's been happening over a period of time. Mm. Yeah. To, to think that uh, there's a magic medicine that we will take and we'll cure this all of a sudden, that's, you know, obviously that can't happen. 
So it has to be a very strategic and, uh, you know, a very collaborative approach. Uh, the government has been doing that over the last few years and will continue to work, you know, to do this. So we, you know, we need to partner uh, with uh, NGOs and partner with the community. So what, one thing that we want to do um, uh, more and more is actually empower the community. So the community understands that, um, that it's within their best interest to take the lead role mm -hmm. in regards to diabetes. And some of the things that we're going to do is, as you know, in every health center in the Lamino Sori corridor, mm -hmm. there is a outpatient department, and then they have what is called a specialist outpatient department, where the doctors that work there, then during a day that's assigned, they look after, then see the diabetic patients and bl blood pressure patients. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do different now, we're going to uh, the specialists from CWM have been doing it, but now they're going to be actually seeing mm -hmm the diabetes and the hypertension patients in these clinics. Mm -hmm. Not only limited to the Lamedosori corridor, but also elsewhere. So we're getting the specialists to actually come down to that level, mm -hmm. be able to provide advice at the health center level. Well, we've noticed that you, you don't even have to look at data. You just have to walk around and you can see that there's an alarming number of young individuals, most of them just around the median age in the country, who are either overweight, who have health issues already, they may have hypertension, some of them have already got diabetes. And just within the past two or three years, I can say from my personal experience, family members and also uh, close friends who have developed complications. And what they tend to do is uh, they think that the best thing to do is to just get on it full on, you know, hit the road running, get into exercise. But unfortunately, in one case, it didn't work out. There was a lady who was slightly overweight. Uh, she decided to get into an exercise routine that was a little too strenuous. And what happened was just one day she collapsed and she unfortunately passed away. And the doctor said that the reason that she passed away was because there was a blood vessel that burst because of the exercise that she was just, you know, pushing her body through. So that's the other end of the spectrum of what happens. What advice would you give those people who have these issues and they're also trying to get fit, but they're just doing it too much? <coughs> Yeah, the, um, I think the most important thing is to, first of all, encourage the public to get fit mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, you know, and have physical activity. I think there's a lot of evidence out there. Uh, you know, we talk about the 30 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour. The more, the better. Mm -hmm. right. uh, the more, the better. Uh, personally, uh, I have a group that I, and I've been doing this ever since before I, become, I became minister. So every lunchtime, uh, one to two, if Alba Park is free, I go there, do a little bit of running around, play touch, do some exercises with a group of friends. Mm -hmm. And then I go, so I think that's important. You set a time, mm -hmm. and he just say, go, this is it, I'm going to set a time for physical exercise. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> you know, there's also the 10,000 steps, so some people have the pedometer, mm -hmm. and they walk 10,000. Whatever it is, the physical activity is so important. Mm -hmm. well, I think the most important thing is to keep on doing every day, uh, and rather than binge exercise, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like don't do anything and all of a sudden on Saturday you're going to do one huge one, because it doesn't work that way. Right. Now, give an example. The lung is like a balloon. And so if you remember when, uh, you know, when you're a child and you had a birthday party and you put the balloons up, the next day what happened to the balloons? The same size or they came down? They, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. They, they, they. So that's how, that's, I think that's just a very simple example mm -hmm. of how it's important for example, aerob aerobic fitness, then we keep on working every day. You need to keep on blowing the balloon so that the balloon can be up and that's your lungs, for example. <coughs> right, so that's one aspect. Let's look at something else that uh, most people tend to harp on about is uh, the state of uh, public health care, saying that infrastructure needs to obviously have an upgrade. They say that services or the standard of services that are being provided also needs to uh, be looked at. Uh, especially since you have a public health care system, people are sick and they, they want to feel as though when they go there to seek assistance, that they don't feel like they're being rejected or that they're being misdiagnosed or mistreated. What would you say to that? Is 2019 going to be any different? The uh, public's response to a health care system is going to be any different this time around? The, yeah, thank you. The, um, we, 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 we want to be responsive. <coughs> and we champion ourselves being responsive, and that's happened even before, mm. you know, I came in, even with Honorable uh, 
Akbar's even before that, Honorable Usamate, mm. and even Honorable Chikolubieni's time. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we have a health complaints line uh, that's running really well. Mm. I can assure you now that the complaints have actually decreased. Uh, it was actually quite high, but now it's actually decreased. We also understand, the government understands that uh, we've inherited uh, the debilitating facilities that we have now. Mm. Have. But this is our time, and that's why we've made uh, the government has actually um, gone on this uh, this exercise mm -hmm. to actually build, rebuild, renovate, maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a few challenges uh, that are there. Uh, of course, as you know, the building industry has really taken off in our country. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, the Minister of Health is, is also, you know, if, for example, regular people are struggling to find you know, contractors and uh, equipment, you can imagine even within the Ministry of Health. But we will get it done. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I think the great thing is that it's budgeted. Right. And we just need to ensure, that's one of the reasons why I've been going right around the country, is actually just reminding our senior uh, health officials, like, mm -hmm. budget is there, it's budgeted. Mm -hmm. Let's just keep on pressing, let's keep on, you know, trying to get, make sure that it's actually done. So we're going to do that. And that's actually being done, we just have to continue doing that. Okay, thank, thank you, you, sir. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. So last segment you mentioned uh, something about budget reallocations last year. When the budget one was announced, we all heard um, what was in store for the Ministry of Health, but for the benefit of the public, um, what can people expect in terms of upgrades? Uh, we know that uh, the Lotoka and Bar hospitals are um, currently undergoing upgrades. Most of them are ready now. So tell us about what's in store for hospitals and health centers uh, in 2019. Thank you. <coughs> we, towards the end of last year, uh, Nakasi uh, Health Center, which is, this is actually Health Center A. So it's a top of the range health center. Got everything, you know, blood test, x-ray, uh, dental, that's open. Uh, so yeah, there was government funding, obviously. Uh, also the McCoy Low Risk Delivery Center. Uh, one thing that I do want to do is actually try to uh, encourage people within the Nasinu Corridor to utilize Makwe and utilize Nakasi. We also have the new Nabosa Subdivisional Hospital, uh, mm -hmm. and I've been up to see it about a week ago. I uh, expect it to be open in 2019. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's an awesome place. You know, my mom's from Nabosa, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's awesome in the middle of the country mm -hmm. to have a hospital, you know, of that nature. So that, that's awesome. Also, we have the CWM Hospital Matenti, you know, the new 200-bed facility. Mm -hmm. So there's been budgetary allocations uh, for that already, and, and the building has uh, already begun phase one. So that's going to take a bit of time, about two or three years. <coughs> also, this uh, budgeted is uh, looking at uh, developing a new uh, Valilevu uh, subdivisional hospital. Mm -hmm. And so and I hear at the moment that uh, already engagement has happened with the consultants. Uh, the upgrading of the operating theatres in Lotok Hospital, as you know, there was a fire. Mm -hmm. uh, and also maintenance works all around the health facilities throughout Fiji. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of uh, capital projects happening in, uh, within the Ministry of Health. So those are capital projects, but one thing that has set every tongue wagging the moment it was announced uh, in the budget was the Parenthood Assistance Payment. And there was $5 million that was set aside for that. Uh, in case anyone has any queries about that, after childbirth, Fijian mothers from families with a household income of below $30,000 will be given $1,000 in an HFC bank account. <coughs> $500 will be available immediately, and then $500 will be accessed when the child enters year one. Now, we're already into the second week of 2019, and of course, this has been activated some time ago. How has it been looking for the ministry so far? The, um, obviously, it's a great initiative. Um, as you know, the, um, you know, I have a granddaughter, so I look at my daughter and I look at the struggles she faces as a, as a mom. And I realized that's where I was when I, you know, when I had my first child. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's an awesome you know, initiative, you know, helping <coughs> with a child. And it's not only the child, it's also the mom. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, the child feeds from the mom. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's actually helping the child, helping the mom through that first few months. And also, and as you know, the other half is when they go to school. We also have to remember that as a part of government's uh, social protection plans is actually, you know, for those mothers um, that uh, 
uh, that are poor and um, you know they they are entitled to is that support for food vouchers mm -hmm. you know before they actually give birth so you can imagine for a, um, a, a, a you know a mum who's uh, struggling a bit she has support before they give birth mm -hmm. and then even after they give birth so you know that's uh, it, it's an awesome idea uh, and it, it's all about making sure that uh, we support mums mm -hmm. and also we support the neonates mm -hmm. There's a lot of evidence also to suggest that uh, when the, the neonate has got it right in terms of nutrition, in terms of support, then they're really being set up to be a great adult. In terms of a holistic approach, looking at newborns and how the family is going to cope, especially for those who are first-time parents, I think it's a great initiative by the government to increase maternity leave and also to introduce the, uh, the, uh, the males. I'm Paternity Sorry, leave. paternity leave, paternity yes. Leave. Thank you for that. Uh, looking at it from a point of view, from a medical standpoint, do you think that this is going to encourage males uh, as uh, fathers to step up to the plate to make sure that they also play an important role in the first few months of development for the child and, of course, with the family? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer that it's, you know, it's very useful. Um, and the fact that we've done it, actually shows there's, you know, there's a lot of vision around the thinking around that. The um, one thing is for sure, that neonates need support, mm -hmm. young mothers need support, and the best person to support them is obviously dad. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, we're also quite uh, fortunate that uh, in our cultures, uh, you know, there's a lot of support from extended family, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from, you know, grandma, grandpa. But I think, you know, the opportunity for dad to spend, you know, a week with, with a new, you know, uh, new child mm -hmm. is actually quite fascin fascinating and also very important. Mm -hmm. As a father of four, would you um, have liked to have something like that when you... Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's talk about uh, one of the most expensive forms of treatment in Fiji uh, is the is dialysis treatment. Mm -hmm. And over the past few years, the government has really been uh, working on making it cheaper. So t uh, talk to us about the new dialysis subsidy scheme. Thank you. With the scheme, um, those who are entitled uh, under the scheme uh, is the, they have an opportunity to have dialysis for um, uh, $75 because essentially it's $150 and government pays the other $75. That's the subsidy. We have already, uh, it's begun already in Lombasa. Uh, the super one is due to open at the end of March or April and we're working on the Nandi facility. That's already in progress. Now, dialysis uh, and uh, you know kidney failure, as you know, in Fiji is because predominantly because of NCDs, so diabetes, high blood pressure, right. and then kidneys fail, and that's why they need <coughs> dialysis. So that's all part of what we call renal replacement therapy. We are very blessed in Fiji that uh, we've been able to have this subsidy. There are lots of countries around the world that don't have subsidy. There are some countries around the world uh, that have subsidy, and it takes a huge chunk of government's budget to be able to do that. But we are quite fortunate that uh, uh, that we have a subsidy in place. By reducing the cost, it's ensuring that uh, that uh, every physician has an opportunity when they have the disease to actually live longer mm -hmm. with the disease, with you know end-stage renal disease, because they can afford uh, dialysis. And again, just to come back a little bit, our focus now is actually trying to prevent people from getting kidney disease. We've been focusing on that. Unfortunately, you can do so much public health. Mm -hmm. You can try and stop as much, you know, kidney failures. But right. there's always going to be patients mm -hmm. who will have that. So we also have to be ready on this side. So we can focus on primary health care and public health, try and prevent diabetes, try and prevent stroke, and so forth. But you've got to remember, there's always going to be patients that go through the sieve. Mm -hmm. And that the government's done very well in looking after those. So with the uh, dialysis subsidy scheme, there's also the uh, free medicine scheme, mm. and um, uh, there's a new model that was uh, proposed in the last budget, but we'll discuss that right after the break. Thank you. Welcome back. So we're discussing the free medicine scheme, and there's, uh, there's a new model that was proposed in the budget, right? Yeah. And there's also been an increase in the number of medications that have been included yes. in this list. Uh, there was some hullabaloo created just during the uh, elections period last year. 
but hopefully those have been uh, quelled and now the public can rest assured that they can access those. But for those who still have doubts, would you please explain to them how it works? Thank you. We've, uh, uh, so, so, so government has, uh, has graciously started on this free medicine scheme. Uh, as you all know, uh, you can pick these medicines from uh, private pharmacies. The old model was it was supplied uh, by our pharmaceutical services to these pharmacies and then uh, uh, Fijians went and, and took it from them. Uh, the new model is that uh, the, the private pharmacies will have their own stock mm -hmm. and uh, the patients will come and take any of these 142 medicines. Before it was less than 60, now it's 142. And then bill to government and then obviously government will then pay them mm -hmm. for those medicines that have been taken from uh, their shelves. Looking at the eligibility criteria, some may say that, oh, but what if uh, I don't know whether or not I'm eligible for this? What do they need to tick off in those boxes? Um, certainly with the, the, the free medicine schemes, obviously there's a process around it. Um, any of our officials will be happy to you know, answer those questions for them, mm -hmm. uh, either through their area medical officers or subdivisional health officers or even with the nurses at the nursing stations, or even with the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. As I said, we also have that uh, one, you know, that the complaints line. So the complaints line doesn't have to be a complaint, it can even be a question, mm -hmm. and we can answer them for them. Let's look at another cause of uh, death, something that, of course, most people cannot do much about is cancer, or the various types of cancer. You have uh, people who have been just going out of the world uh, on, in a very alarming rate, this has happened in my family in the past few years. I have lost about five family members to this. Uh, looking at treatment in the country, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, radiation therapy is not part of the uh, treatment that's prescribed here? We don't have radiation therapy at the moment, but I can assure you that we have cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. So when I worked within the Ministry of Health, I did recently I, was like, I also operated on people with cancer. So we have a growing cohort of um, our specialists that have trained here and went abroad. We have our own medical oncologist, Dr. Annie Viu. Mm -hmm. We have a neurosurgeon, Dr. Alan Bilbo, who operates on some people who have cancers in the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our pediatric surgeons and pediatricians mm -hmm. who look after children cancers. And so, we, you know, we have cancer treatment that's not available in some countries around the Pacific in terms of the, the surgical component, the operating component, and also in terms of medicine, chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, we continue to grow in, in that area uh, with the hope, that, you know, obviously at some stage that, uh, you know, we can have, you know, uh, further uh, treatments that are not available here, uh, like radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. But I want to assure us that we have cancer treatment. And one of the reasons that uh, people come late is because they think we don't have cancer treatment. No, we have cancer treatment. What determines survival or outcome is three things. Number one is how aggressive the disease is. Mm -hmm. Number two is the treatment available and um, you know and that's available. Uh, yeah. And then number three is, is obviously how fit the person is. So if somebody's got a cancer and they keep on waiting at home and then they lose weight and become weak mm -hmm. and the cancer is quite aggressive and then they're actually weak, you know the treatment will not be able to work very well. So I think the most important thing is people need to understand that the earlier they come, mm -hmm. then with treatment, they have a potential for cure. Mm -hmm. Well, since this is the second last segment, let's look at something that also concerns members of the medical fraternity themselves, the public sector reform that has happened. No longer are uh, public servants having a lifelong uh, job. They have to work on a tenureship basis. What's the response like so far with doctors and nurses? Um, the <coughs> with, with as, as you know, with the doctors, I can uh, talk you know uh, confidently with the doctors to begin with. Mm -hmm. The doctors have had a very significant salary increase about two, three years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, right after that was obviously the discussion of going on to this contract system. Um, for for those of us who've been overseas and trained overseas, we went on a contract, so we understand completely what what's needed, mm -hmm. um, and we came back. Uh, I then went into the Fiji National University. Mm -hmm. All the doctors in the Fiji National University are on contract. Uh, and then, so it's been uh, received relatively quite well. Th there are challenges everywhere. Uh, I, know, I do know for a fact that there are also a few uh, 
few number of uh, disgruntled uh, graduates who have recently, not, not, in, uh, not just with MBBS, uh, but for example, therapy, uh, dentistry and, and other uh, non-essential services. Well, I wouldn't call them non-essential services, but then for, let's talk about the employment prospects for those graduates in, uh, in 2019. The, um, we, as you know, we have an establishment within the Ministry of Health. Um, there are vacancies in certain areas. Obviously, I don't have the numbers off yeah. the top of my head. Uh, we aspire to fill all our vacancies uh, that we have, and obviously, when opportunities arise, they're more than welcome, you know, obviously, to apply and, and, and be part of us. Um, as a population, we are growing. Uh, so, obviously, our establishment, the establishment of doctors, as I said, when I started, was 200. You know, obviously, it's increased because of many reasons. One of it is obviously because, obviously, the population of our country has steadily, slowly increased. So, you know, so we, we have to um, increase, uh, you know, appropriately to that. Uh, so, the, you know, uh, doctors will not be alive forever. You know, they will, you know, the, they will they have to retire, drop dead, and somebody has to take over their place. Mm -hmm. So th that, that, that cycle continues. I think the, 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 the challenge that we have at the moment is being able to ask ourselves, you know, the, uh, the, the question of, okay, we, we have these new facilities. Uh, you know, how many new staff do we need? Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the doctors, nurses, uh, radi radiographers and, and you know and the lab technicians. So being able to make sure that uh, we we have a staffing needs that's reflective, and being able to employ those who are ready and who are actually graduating. We'll come back with the final segment right after the break. Welcome back to For the Record. Now, Doctor, let's talk about some of the work that the Ministry of Health has recently done uh, for typhoid control. Thank you. Uh, yeah, typhoid, uh, uh, we had a typhoid epidemic up in uh, Naita Siri and also in the Mosi. And uh, <coughs> our uh, public health and the Ministry of Health officials were responsive. Uh, we were there from get go uh, working. Uh, with the community, obviously, uh, with typhoid, it's about sanitation. Uh, uh, not only that, but also the you know water source and so all these things. So you know it was a collaborative and a very wholesome approach. Uh, so they camped, they they spent every day there, uh, both in uh, Naitasi and also in Namosi. I was up in Namosi. I spent a night in Namosi uh, with the village, you know, talking to them. Uh, trying to source another water source because obviously the one that they currently have is not enough. Uh, then came back, um, and I must say that uh, you know I've been very proud with the way that uh, we've responded. Uh, you know, not only in terms of advice, picking those who are sick and treating them, the clinical component, but the public health component was actually setting up water tanks, um, uh, making sure that it was actually set and set up in proper way. Uh, actually helping the villagers to actually dig more uh, toilets and making sure there were at least water to, uh, water seal or flush toilets. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a very comprehensive approach and that's the way we need to tackle this. Well, looking forward to 2019 and what's been set out in the budget, there's been $7.4 million set aside for the outsourcing of janitorial and security services for health facilities. Why that much money for all this work? Yeah, in <coughs> Interesting, um, as you know, with um, <coughs> with security services in the hospital, um, it's been you know outsourced for quite a while now, um, and the, the reason is so that we can you know concentrate on our core function, mm -hmm. which is actually providing you know uh, care for patients, mm -hmm. um, and you know getting security firms who have experience in these areas mm -hmm. to be able to provide security. Having said that, we still have problems. Uh, with patients and relatives, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I want to use this opportunity uh, to ask the public mm -hmm. to, you know, appreciate our health system, mm -hmm. appreciate the, you know, the stress that our staff go through, and and I'm talking as a person who's been a surgeon for twenty, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. the last twenty years. It's actually very stressful, uh, right. and one thing I keep on saying in the communities that I've been, some communities actually, you know, where there is a uh, there's a, a doctor and a nurse alone in a community. They've, you know, sometimes felt threatened. 
So I've been going around, and in these communities, I've been keep on, I keep on saying to them, please accept them as your own. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, treat them the way you want to treat your children, or treat your parents, you know, treat your brothers and sisters, because we now have professionals. They are like the Fiji Sevens team. When they're relaxed, and when they're on song, they're at their best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but th I mean that's uh, it is really important because uh, perception does affect a person's, uh, you know, ability to go to a hospital and get themselves checked. Um, otherwise, people, you know, resort to herbal medicine or natural remedies. That's so right. um, I guess uh, restoring, well, well, not restoring, but strengthening public's faith in in doctors and nurses is something that is really important to you. Well, it's before really we important. wrap things yeah. up for the show, since we're towards the end, uh, Doctor, any last words for what the public can expect, at least in the first quarter of this year? Thank you. I mean, uh, we, we are here to serve. Uh, that's our role. We made it very clear to ourselves that, uh, you know, we are in a vocation, we're not in a, in a job. Uh, and so we will, we will serve and we will try to serve the best of our ability. We are open. Uh, to criticism, so we are open uh, to suggestions on how we can improve the way we serve. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're serving the public, and that's that's one thing that I want to make very clear. Mm. Please don't hesitate to use our complaints line and and tell us how we can make it better. Uh, but the only thing I keep on asking is, please protect your health professionals. Yeah. And just very quickly before we end, um, what is the health line for those who may not know? One five seven. One five seven, mm -hmm. Doctor, thank you for joining us. It was a very productive discussion, and we hope to have you again sometime on the show. Naka, thank you. That's all we have for you tonight. Thank you for joining us on the show. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.